So, what on earth is knowledge sharing? It is used in most industries, especially design, tech, in fact, anywhere where there's a team to be found. It's used in our day-to-day -day interactions. It is simply the exchange of ideas, telling someone what's on your mind, telling someone a about a project you're working on. And it can be improved when used correctly. There's one thing telling people and there's just end the conversation there. And then there's another thing telling someone and reciprocating, asking them to give you feedback on that point of view, asking them to help you improve on what you're telling them about. Ask them to just help you, you know, break it down a bit more. A lot of business teams, well, a lot of designs teams especially, will have honest knowledge sharing sessions where everyone brings their ideas to the table. They'll destroy it. They will tear it apart and rebuild it up together. A lot of these can be called ideation sessions, team building activities, whatever it is. It's just the opportunity to talk to another person and take your ideas from one stage to the other. So, filling the skill gap with knowledge sharing is the first focus, right? The three things are, what is the end goal? What are you trying to achieve with this skill, right? Is it to become more employable? Is it to, I don't know, just fulfill a hobby you're working on even better? And the other thing to consider is, have you approached it before? And by that, it's an opportunity to reflect on how you approached it previously. So when you're talking to someone about the skill you want to work on, whether it's design, whether it's, hey, I, I want to learn how to make logos properly, I want to learn how to edit my videos properly, you can have that discussion from the point of view of, this is what I've done previously. And then that person you're talking to has a vision in their head of what it is you're trying to achieve. And if they're an expert in that field, they can already start correcting you and start giving you advice. The other thing to consider is what is your learning style? A lot of people simply just go on YouTube, watch, try and just digest that information. Some people will watch this video, for example, and try and digest that information. They could be visual learners. There's also audio learners or people who like to listen whilst they do the activity, right? People who like to be a part of that experience. And tactile learners, people who like to just give it a go and learn from their mistakes. So what is your learning style? What are you going to communicate to this person when you tell them about how you previously approached it? What I'm trying to do is get you in the mindset of how am I doing this? How do I pitch this vision, essentially? I'm trying to get you to imagine this a bit more. Imagine yourself talking to someone. You could practice talking to yourself in the mirror or you could just go to mum or dad in the kitchen and just tell them what your idea is. Build on that conversation and try and get that feedback and get an idea of what it's like to communicate it. So here's the thing. Finding the right people, right persons to help you. Now, this is really hard because you have to open up to people. You have to essentially let someone know you don't know how to do something. And that's very uncomfortable for people, especially in this day and age where social media is rife with everyone pretending they're rich or everyone pretending they've got what it takes and all this. And in many cases, that's not true, right? So it's really hard to be vulnerable and say, hey, I need help with someone. But you need to get used to that. If you really care about this skill you want to develop, you need to get used to being vulnerable. And as part of that experience, it's a case of, well, how do you approach this? Well, we've got different ways of, you know, reaching out to people and getting their help. You've got open source. Now, this could be just doing a Instagram story like I did for this event, right? On Even on my personal channel, I posted it. Hey, guys, please join. You can do your close connections where you can actually reach out to friends and family, help them, ask them to help you spread the word. Or targeted, why don't you go to the experts yourself, go to a university tutor, go to someone who is on, on their social platforms doing it, doing what you want to achieve and learn. Those are the three essentially main ways you can take this and they all you know spread out into their own branches. Now, open source, for example, could be also putting a LinkedIn post up and then just going, hey, I really need help developing this skill, so I want to do this. And LinkedIn being the kind of space it is of everyone trying to prove that they're worthy in many ways. It's also the kind of space where people want to show their worthiness by helping you. So that's a really good place to start if you're trying to develop a skill, to be honest. Take away the fear of, oh, will it make me look bad to employers? Well, no, it makes it look like you're the kind of person that'll let, be honest and let them know that, hey, I really need to develop the skills. You're a developing person. You're someone who's willing to grow, not someone who's just stuck in the way they are thinking they're perfect. Next is understanding if that person can help you, right? Now I've written out four key things to consider. It is, what are their key capabilities and skill sets? Why are they worth talking to about this skill you want to develop? Is it just someone you know? Well, that's fine. Maybe they can help you reach someone with the capabilities and skill sets you need. So the vision I'm going to pitch now is, I really want to learn how to edit a video. 
the best profession for this would be a videographer. So if I went for a targeted approach, I'd look for someone who's a videographer, someone who's on, I don't know, LinkedIn or Fiverr or something, pay them to teach me, I guess. But then the one after that is, well, how experienced are they? You need to consider how long have they been doing this skill that you want to learn or how long have they been doing this approach or been trying to learn as a beginner, for example, how long have they been trying and failing? Now, this isn't a case of if they've not been doing it for five years, don't talk to them anymore, leave them. No, that's not the approach. If they have been doing it for one year, okay, fine. In that one year, how did they start? What have they struggled with? Because if you're in your first year of learning the skill, you want to compare your experiences to theirs and then your knowledge sharing. You turn them how you did it and then they can tell you how they did it in their first year. You can essentially grow together. So someone who's got a lack of experience is not a case that they're not useful to you. They could be a partner on this journey. They could be someone you can work with to develop your skills together or you can exchange skills, for example. They might be doing something else but they might have a learning strategy that you can benefit from. We all know the people who have a very low boiling point. I'd say even I used to be that kind of person, you know, jump to conclusions, very aggressive. People who are also very cutthroat, just say things how they are and they might hurt your feelings. Or people that are just really nice, really softly spoken, just lovely to talk to. Now there's positives and benefits to both sides of these types of temperaments. You can have someone who's really softly spoken to, but that person might just massage your ego all the time and make you think everything's perfect and not actually tell you what's wrong, what you're not doing right. So you need to look for someone that essentially will tell you how it is, but communicates it properly, not aggressively communicating the way where it's actual feedback, where it's beneficial feedback. Now you might see that more on someone who's quite aggressive and you might see it as, you know, oh, they just get straight to the point. But that person could also be overly aggressive and might put you in an uncomfortable situation where you don't feel like taking that information in anymore. You just feel attacked. So you need to consider your temperament as well as the person you're going to be communicating with. They don't have to be a clone of you. They don't have to talk and communicate in the same way you do. You have to find someone who does it in a way that you can digest without feeling attacked. Or if you do feel attacked, you have to be in a position where you can tell that person that, hey, I mean, there's nice ways to put it. You want to be in the right mindset to be able to absorb the information. And you want to be in the right mindset to give back the right information. You don't want to be told your idea is crap. You don't want to be told that, hey, you're terrible at editing videos because what could what could come out of the back of that? What could come out of the back of being told that you're terrible at ed editing videos is if you're teaching that person, I don't know how to run a business, you might start attacking them now and start going, oh, you're terrible at running businesses as well. That's not the right way to do it. That's not the right way to knowledge share. You want to be in a situation where you can take things back and forth, work together, right? And then after that, it's availability. So let's say you're getting closer, you found someone who's got the right skill sets or a skill set you can benefit from at this stage. They've got the an experience that you can also benefit from at this stage and temperaments, you, you're working on it. It's not perfect, but you're working on it. Their skill sets and experience outweighs how mean they are to you sometimes and it's fine. Okay, then availability. Well, how are you gonna meet up? Are you gonna meet up weekly, bi-weekly or ad hoc basis? Do you want it to be someone that you can reach out to at any time you need some help and they can help and you know support you or do you want it to be a case of, on our lunch breaks because we work together let's just meet up then you need to consider that and how you consider that is try and understand what their schedule is first you already you already know what your schedule is you already have an idea of when you're available and you're not but if you really want to learn this skill and you really want it to come from this person understand what their schedule is first you don't need to do it back and forth of when you're available well i'm available this day just this week what day is best for you once they confirm the day or whether it's next week or not once they confirm the day okay then you re respond with, well, these are the times that are good for me in these dates. What time works best for you? And now they've got a range they can respond to you within. They can tell you, I don't know, lunch times are good for me. That's fine. You've now got a schedule you can work to. You've now understood that person's availability. Or my calendar's a bit hectic and I'm not too sure when I'll be next available. That's also okay. You kind of look at it and go, right, well, we can have our first session on this day and then work on, once that session's done, schedule the next. Now incentivizing. What core values are you going to give to the person? What core values are you going to share? It doesn't always have to be about money. It doesn't always have to be about paying someone to learn a skill. A lot of us pay to go to university and assume that we're paying to develop a skill or develop an experience. And that's not always the case. You're kind of paying to also meet the right people and get the right contacts. And they're already paying for their experience and you're a part of that experience. Same as working somewhere. You don't pay to work somewhere. They pay for you to work there. So money doesn't have to be the incentive to be in the right position to get help from people. Rather, it's what you call values. Does that person really care about the environment just like you? Have you got a common thing that makes you friends? Or 
you might have similar interests. It might be a case that person wants to learn how to do their accountancy because they're working on this charity idea and they don't understand the money, but you're good with money, but you don't understand how to do the logos and the creatives and marketing, but they're good with that kind of thing. Right, so you've got shared interest there and you've got shared project that you could probably learn skills off and that becomes, you know, a common value you can work on. But that also links to what I'm going to talk to talk about next, which is skill swapping. It's sharing skills and in conversations, you'd ask each other, what have, I, what have you been up to? How did you get to where you are now? And you could talk about something and then it gets interesting. And I could say, hey, hey, I'm Sam, really good at money. And they could say, hey, I'm really good at design marketing and I've been doing this. Like, oh, that's interesting. I need a bit of help with that. Let's swap skills. I can, you know, help with your business, help you with your forecasting. And in exchange, how about you teach me how to make logos or something? That's a skill swap right there. That's an incentive for that person to keep working with you because they can keep growing through your journey, through your experience, and you can keep growing through theirs. And you've now got someone that you can work with going onwards.